Jellyfish are truly alien. Formless and translucent, they have no head, no heart, no brain. Deep in the oceans, before any animal trod the earth, they were here. They have flourished for over 600 million years. They inspire in us the same superstitious fear as the ocean depths themselves. Magnificent assassins, they can kill in seconds. And they can invade in mass. When they strike, we have practically no defense. Dangerous jellyfish occur everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Yet they are not our mortal enemies. They have mysterious abilities, which scientists are using to improve human health, to unlock the mysteries of cancer, aging, and genetic disease. And in astonishing new research, scientists have discovered that these primeval creatures may even hold the promise of eternal life. What's so special about this jellyfish is its ability to overturn a fundamental principle of biology. These accomplishments have revolutionized science, providing valuable new tools for understanding living organisms. All of this really started by a protein that was found in a jellyfish. There's more to this ancient enigma than meets the eye. The coast of Queensland looks like a tropical paradise. But appearances can be deceptive. Here, swimming can cost you your life. For here lurks a creature more stealthy and more deadly than any mere shark or crocodile. It is the most venomous animal in the world. This is the domain of the box jellyfish, Chironex fleckeri also known as the sea wasp. Its tentacles are three meters long. They contain enough venom to kill dozens of people. The slightest brush with Chironex triggers instant, unbearable pain. Lisa Ann Gershwin is a world-renowned expert on Chironex stings and their prevention. When Chironex stings human skin, millions and millions and millions of little tiny droplets of venom go into the skin and they travel through the bloodstream and very, very quickly they do their damage. The tentacles stick to the skin and cause an intense burning sensation. If you're lucky, you come out of your encounter with Chironex scarred for life. If you're not lucky, you'll be dead. The killer has already notched up over 70 victims. Death happens very quickly, often in about two to three minutes. And it's amazing because it's the only thing we know of in the natural world that stops the heart in a contracted state. The deadly jellyfish lurk near the beaches of Northern Australia between November and May, just when the tourist season is at its peak. Risking one's life for a swim is not what most tourists have in mind. Parts of the beach are closed off by protective nets, which the Chironex cannot penetrate. In case of accident, an army of lifeguards trained in emergency first aid stands ready to intervene. Okay, so with the first aid, the first thing we would do, of course, is uh, douse the stung area with vinegar. And of course, vinegar doesn't stop what's already envenomated into the skin. But what it does do is it neutralizes the cells that are still in the, still in the upper layers of the skin and on the tentacles. Because if we don't neutralize those, what can happen is if somebody was to rub or move that, that tentacle around, they could be stung even worse. The name Chironex actually comes from Cairo, which is hand, because they have these hands on each of the four corners, and the tentacles come from each of the fingers of the hand. 
and nex meaning death or deadly. So it's basically the hand of death, which is a fantastic name for the deadliest animal on earth. Chironex fleckeri is named after Dr. Hugo Flecker, who first identified it as a killer. The death of a five-year-old boy in the summer of 1955 drove Flecker to make a systematic search for the creature responsible. Once the box jellyfish had been identified, biologists at Melbourne's Commonwealth Serum Laboratory could study the poison and work on an anti-venom. They injected rabbits with small doses of venom till the rabbits were immunized, then isolated the antibodies. The resulting anti-venom can save lives, but only if it arrives in time. I've heard people say, oh, it's okay, if I get stung, I'll just get the anti-venom. But they don't realize that it takes minutes, some number of minutes, to deliver the anti-venom to the patient and for the anti-venom to go through the body so it can work. But the time of death is two to three minutes. So if it takes 15 minutes to get the antivenom and you're dead in two minutes, you can't rely on the antivenom. You have to actually prevent the sting. Chironex isn't intentionally aggressive towards humans. In fact, it tends to avoid contact with those who venture onto its hunting grounds. But of course, its long tentacles can't differentiate between swimmers and prey animals. I think that the venom is probably so powerful because Chironex itself is a very delicate animal and it catches fast fish and big crabs and things like that. So it needs to stop them instantly. Despite the fact that they can only move slowly and that they're themselves so fragile, jellyfish can capture prey much faster and tougher than themselves. But the deadly strike capacity of jellyfish isn't merely due to the strength of their toxins. They have a remarkably effective way of delivering the poison, both sure and very, very fast. Their tentacles are covered in millions of capsules full of venom, known as nematocysts. The nestle cells Nematocysts are truly one of nature's wonders. And if we look closely at how the nematocysts really function in order to catch a prey, then they seem even more marvelous. The nematocysts have extremely sensitive hairs which stick out from the surface. At the slightest contact, they trigger the release of a tiny harpoon, which pierces the flesh and delivers the poison directly into the victim's bloodstream. This discharge process is one of the fastest in nature. In order really to analyze it, you need a very high-speed camera, which is capable of taking around several million pictures per second. The nematocysts measure only a few hundredths of a millimeter. A fragment of living tentacle is placed under a high-resolution microscope. A nematocyst is positioned at the center of the field and electrodes attached. Then, an electrical discharge artificially triggers the action of the nematocyst. The pictures recorded by the camera make it possible to measure the speed at which the nematocysts are released. It's the first time this has ever been achieved. We have discovered that the critical phase of discharge, the release of the harpoons, happens in an incredibly short time, just 600 nanoseconds. In other words, in just 600,000 millionths of a second, the prey will be pierced by millions of tiny harpoons. That means that within this tiny time frame, they attain phenomenal acceleration. An acceleration roughly in the order of 5 million Gs. 5 million Gs means 5 million times the Earth's gravity. 
That's over a hundred times the acceleration of a bullet traveling down the barrel of a rifle. This enormous acceleration is necessary because the mass of the capsules is infinitesimal. This tiny mass must be projected incredibly fast in order to produce a sufficient impact at the point where the harpoons hit their prey. Faced with such a powerful weapon, the prey has little chance of escaping. Once the prey has been paralyzed by the venom, tentacles carry it to the jellyfish's mouth. It's then digested in the gastric cavity, a simple pocket which serves as a stomach. Each adult box jellyfish has over 5,000 million nematocysts. For the Queensland authorities, it is vital to gain a better understanding of Chironex behavior. Matt Gordon and Teresa Carette are scientists from James Cook University, based at Cairns. They're carrying out a study which they hope will help them predict just when and where killer jellies are likely to strike. It may then be possible to prevent unfortunate encounters between jellyfish and tourists. Pyronex flackeri is a coastal species. Rarely do you find them more than a couple of hundred metres from the coastline. And more specifically, it's sort of those shallow, sandy, nice, calm beaches that people themselves want to go and swim at, but the box jellyfish seem to like the most. To carry out their research, the two scientists have no choice but to venture onto the killer jellyfish's territory. They kit themselves out very carefully to limit any risk of accident. Their diving suits are thick enough to block the stings. So what we've got here is the ultrasonic tag that we're going to glue onto the box jellyfish. They're only about 17 millimetres long and weigh less than a gram. So we have tags now that are small enough and light enough that they don't influence the way the box jellyfish is behaving. Now they just have to catch a jellyfish. Since chironexes are practically transparent, they're particularly difficult to spot. When the scientists see one, they have to act fast. Is it? You're right with that one? Karanix's body isn't poisonous. As long as they avoid any contact with the tentacles, the scientists can manipulate them with their bare hands. The transmitter is fixed using a strong surgical glue, which sticks in seconds to the jellyfish's gelatinous body. The sound signals sent by the transmitter will be recorded by underwater receptors. That tag will then send out a signal for the next 24, 36 hours and allow us to follow it around, plot its position each hour. Once we've done that, we can look at developing a computer model that'll take things such as wave height or wind speed and direction and be able to predict where we're going to find jellyfish. And using that, we can identify where the hotspots are likely to be along the coastline and hopefully better warn the lifeguards. But getting enough data to build computer models that warn lifeguards when and where the jellyfish are likely to appear may take years. In the meantime, the physical barrier of the safety nets keeps the box jellyfish out. But against some creatures, even the nets are inadequate. There's one person who won't be stopping off at the beach today. For Sue Braidwood, it holds some terrible memories. Um, we were holidaying in, in Port Douglas, and it had been quite a hot day, so we went down to the beach. 
we swam in the stinger enclosure because we felt that that was a safe place to be and I felt like a, a bite on my lower arm, just like an insect bite and um, stood up out of the water and had a look, couldn't see anything so got back down into the water to swim. 20 minutes later the full impact of the sting started to hit. the pain it just felt like every muscle in your body was just in a really severe cramp um, then I got then the stomach cramp started uh, chest pain and then um, quite profuse vomiting this is all in the space of two or three minutes uh, and profuse sweating you could actually just see the sweat dripping off me it's like when, you, when you're in labour, having a baby, and you, you're in that, you reach the peak of a contraction, that absolute peak where you just don't feel that you can do that anymore, the pain's just too much, that's the minimum that that pain is at, and it just builds from there. Sue had been stung, not by a Chironex, but by a creature so tiny it literally slipped through the net. It's known as the Irukandji. The jellyfish which causes such devastating effects was only identified in 1961, thanks to the perseverance of a doctor called Jack Barnes. After every case of Irukandji syndrome, Barnes immediately went to the place where the accident occurred and spent hours paddling about in the shallows looking for any creatures which might be responsible. He had few clues. He just knew they must be small and probably transparent since none of their victims had ever been able to see what had attacked them. Then, one December day in 1961, Barnes captured a tiny jellyfish. To see if it was the culprit, Barnes used himself as a guinea pig. He rubbed its tentacles against his arm. A few minutes later, he started to feel intense pain and had to be rushed to hospital. He had finally identified the jellyfish responsible for Irukandji syndrome. It was called Karukia Barnesi. It was named after Barnes because of the extraordinary personal risk he took to bring it to the attention of Western scientists. We've been documenting Irukandji stings since 1943, but the Irukandji people, the Irukandji Aboriginal tribe, actually knew about Irukandji stings long before 1943. They didn't know that it was a jellyfish, but they knew that if you went in the water in the summertime, you'd get sick. They didn't know why, but it's actually because of that knowledge that the name Irukandji was given to the syndrome itself. Sue was lucky enough to survive her encounter with the Irukandji, but is harmed for life. So previously to being stung, I'd been working full time and even now, two years later, I, I can still only um, maintain part-time work, mainly because of the, um, the fatigue, the ongoing fatigue. Yeah. The fact is, we have no idea why the venom acts on humans the way that it does, but it's an absolutely amazing syndrome that it causes in the human body. Absolutely devastating. There is still no anti-venom, nor any other truly effective treatment for Irukandji syndrome. The symptoms can last just a few hours or continue, as in Sue's case, over several years. The sting is rarely fatal, but when two tourists died in 2002, the authorities were galvanized to find a way to protect bathers. The safety nets stopped the Chironex, but not the tiny Irukandji. The nets are highly effective against the Chironex flacrae, but of course they have their little friends, the Irukandji, can be, you know, as small as your thumbnail. Now the mesh itself is uh, one inch, about yay big in size. We can't do it any finer, based on uh, the sand and such. It uh, builds up on top of the net and would, of course, rip it and tear it, make it useless. The only thing to do is to try and detect the Irukandjis before they detect us. Now, Emily's doing a drag. We do it three times a day as a minimum. Sometimes they can do it even up to 16 times in a day. The reasons why we do it is to detect whether there are any jellyfish or any tentacles in the water and close the beach before anyone can get stung. The re 
reason why we're looking in the bucket is because um, we need to look for the animals carefully because they're clear and they're small. And we use the white because we can see their shadows onto the white. A team from the James Cook University based at Townsville set out at night to hunt for Irukandji. In order to devise an anti-venom, or simply to understand how the venom acts on the human body, they need to capture and study a number of animals. The artificial light makes the jellyfish easier to see and even seems to attract them. Ugo, can you please bring him the bowl? Tonight, the light attracts all sorts of marine organisms, but for the moment, not a single Irukandji. What's this? This is a jellyfish. Uh, yeah, 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 you raise a hydra. This one, and the one in the bottom, it's no. not a box jelly. It's also a little bit toxic, but it will never kill you. After several hours, they manage finally to find just one. It's simply not enough for them to be able to analyze what makes up the venom and to start working on an antidote. Back in the laboratory, they will try to produce the venom artificially instead. The idea is to isolate the genes responsible for the venom's extreme toxicity. The scientists then plan to put these genes into bacteria, which will act as a sort of factory to make great quantities of venom. This cloned venom can then be injected into experimental animals to make the anti-venom. Our problem is that we cannot get enough proteins to generate an anti-venom, and that is why we are attempting to clone the individual proteins so that we can accumulate enough protein that we can then inject into an animal to have enough antigen to generate antibodies and therefore get enough anti-venom that we can use to treat people who are stung. Developing an anti-venom is a particularly long process. What's more, the venom's characteristics vary, which makes the scientist's job even more difficult. There are a number of proteins present in the venoms of the jellyfish, and these might vary with age, they might vary with location, the diet that these jellyfish are uh, eating, and we would like to be able to tailor a particular anti-venom for not just Irukandji stings, but a wider range of jellyfish envenomations. A lot of people think of jellyfish as maybe only an Australian problem or maybe only in the tropics or whatever. People have their own notions of where the jellyfish are. But the reality is dangerous jellyfish occur everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It was only in 1801 that science began to take an interest in jellyfish. Then, French scientist Francois Perrault set out on an expedition to Australia. He became fascinated by these strange beings, which had previously been consigned to the uncertain category of creatures known as zoophytes, considered both plant and animal. Perrault was intrigued by their graceful movements and extraordinary numbers. He made detailed observations. For months, he fished for the animals and kept some on board, feeding them and identifying dozens of new specimens. These were beautifully and precisely documented by the ship's artist, Charles-Alexandre Le Sueur. So far, over a thousand different jellyfish species have been identified, but it's believed there are many more as yet unnamed. Not all are dangerous for humans. The smallest are microscopic. The biggest are giants over two meters in diameter whose tentacles can reach 20 meters in length.
The family of jellyfish includes an astonishing diversity of sizes, shapes, and types of behavior. Jellyfish can be found living near the sea surface or in the deeps, in the tropics, or in the icy waters of the Arctic. Jellyfish don't mate. Rather, males release spermatozoids which float in the currents. Some encounter female egg cells and fertilize them. The fertilized egg develops into an elongated larva, which fixes itself onto a rock and continues to develop till it becomes a minuscule organism, a polyp. The polyp and the jellyfish are so unlike each other that for a long time naturalists thought they belonged to different species. What we're looking at right now is a polyp. These polyps are very small, they're like about two or three millimeters long. They have a, a central mouth surrounded by tentacles, which they use for catching prey. These, these animals are, are predators, they're carnivores, they feed on zooplankton. Over the next few weeks, the polyp feeds as much as possible, grabbing anything which comes in reach of its tentacles. Its tentacles are venomous, like those of a mature jellyfish. Once the polyp has gathered enough energy, an extraordinary metamorphosis takes place. The upper part of the polyp splits into segments and turns into a little column of tiny baby jellyfish known as ephyri, joined together at the center. It's what we call strobulation. It's a very unique type of asexual reproduction and metamorphosis. We can see this young medusa are pulsating and that pulsation helps young medusa to get released. All the ephyri liberated by a single polyp are clones, absolutely, totally identical twins. In just a few weeks, they will reach adulthood and be ready to reproduce in their turn. After the fiery got released from one polyp, that polyp can just grow tentacles again and stay as, as it is, or develop more polyp by sexual reproduction. And actually, those polyps are going to be able to strobulate next season, next year. So from one polyp, you can have many polyps that can also strobulate. The tiny polyps fixed to the seabed go on secretly multiplying. But if conditions are favorable, they may start to produce jellyfish simultaneously, which means that quite suddenly, thousands of them are born all at once. The scene is set for a jellyfish invasion. In a few weeks, some 10 million jellyfish of a species never before seen in the region suddenly invaded the coast of the southern United States. Marine biologist Monty Graham knows the area well. Every year we get jellyfish and, you know, and people complain about jellyfish and getting stung by jellyfish. So when somebody comes to us and says, oh, there are blooms of jellyfish, um, you know, we, that's, that's fairly normal. You know, we're not, we're not too, too concerned with being very reactive to that. What was strange was that this invader was of a totally new type. And then somebody started coming in and, and describing how these animals had spots on them. Then one person brought one in to us and we saw it. And I said, where are these animals? And they said, well, they're right offshore, you know, within, within two miles. And we went out and there they were, vast fields of uh, these very bizarre animals. The jellyfish were quite large and covered in white spots. Fortunately, they were not dangerous to humans, but identifying the species proved really problematic. It looked rather like an Australian spotted jelly, known under the scientific name of Phyloriza punctata, only it was bigger and a lighter color.
Monty pursued his research and discovered that there had been invasions of spotted jellyfish in various other parts of the world, in the Mediterranean, Brazil, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. But each time it appeared, the jellyfish had changed slightly, its size and color adapting according to the environment in which it found itself. So if this was the Australian spotted jelly, how had it managed to travel halfway around the world? Perhaps it used a mode of transport often favored by invasive species, hitching a ride. It's been shown for quite a long time that international shipping can translocate animals around the world. One way is by taking in ballast water. They take in ballast water from one area in order to balance the boat. They drop it in another area, and whatever is in that water gets you know, moved along wherever the ship is going. And there have been numerous examples of, of animals that have invaded and become pests that were translocated by, by shipping. In the case of Phyloriza, sp Australian spotted jellyfish, it's thought that they infested the sides of boats, in other words, hull fouling, and they were brought to another place, and that was the way they were translocated. But 10 million jellies didn't all travel by the same boat. Probably only a few individuals were transported in this way, and then, once they'd reached their destination, may have started to multiply. And yet, in order to multiply, polyps need rocks they can fix onto, whereas the seabed of the Gulf is flat and sandy. Monty Graham thought they might be fixing onto the hundreds of gas platforms which dot the area. Their metal pylons could provide an ideal support for the development of the polyps. To test out the hypothesis, Monty Graham and his team decided to set up traps on the gas platforms. The traps were plates made of the kind of material and in the kind of shape that polyps would normally be likely to attach themselves to. The metal structures of the platform form a kind of artificial reef and have been colonized by thousands of marine organisms. Spotting the tiny polyps amongst them would really be like looking for a needle in a haystack. The clean, smooth surfaces of the traps should make it possible to spot the polyps more easily. Divers will come round regularly to inspect. The researchers also take samples from the thick layer of organisms clinging to the pylons. These will be analyzed more closely back in the lab using genetic detection techniques. The polyp stage of the jellyfish were very, very small. So what we needed to do was develop a method in which we could screen lots of areas for different species of jellyfish. So we've developed a DNA method for this, and what I'm doing right now is this is the, the final stage of DNA extraction from some um, scrapings we did from oil rigs. The DNA tests Keith has developed are able to pinpoint the DNA of the invasive Phyloriza polyps amongst that of all the myriad other organisms. We look here at the output from our experiment. What we see here is that the only two that showed a positive um, interaction with the probe were two positive controls, ones that had known amount, known Phyloriza DNA in them. All of the scrapings are here, and they were all negative, indicating that none of them actually had any Phyloriza polyps in them. So their hiding place is still a mystery. Neither the DNA tests nor the traps have given the biologists an indication of where the jellyfish might be reproducing. In future, the scientists will widen their search for the polyps to other zones of the Mexican Gulf as it's possible the jellyfish reproduced much further away and traveled on the ocean currents. Fortunately, spotted jellyfish only live for one season. Between each of their appearances, the ecosystem can recover its balance. Sadly, elsewhere, this is not the case. This Norwegian fjord seems so calm. But beneath the surface, the waters are seething, 
a jellyfish known as Periphyla has taken over. And Periphyla can live for over 30 years. Here they have multiplied to the exclusion of all else. Once there was a thriving fishing community in these waters, today it is no more. Only the scientists who are studying the phenomenon still come and fish here. The nets they bring up are full to bursting, but only with jellyfish. Jellyfish invasions are now occurring all over the world. The Baltic, the Black Sea, Australia, the Bering Sea, the waters of South Africa have all recorded infestations. Professor Ferdinando Buero from the University of Lecce in Italy is convinced a major ecological upheaval is taking place. Every year he monitors Mediterranean jellyfish populations. Over the last 20 years, these proliferations have increased considerably. You could say that where once we had oceans of fish, we're now getting to a situation where they've become what you could call jellyfish oceans, which obviously is a great source of concern to the authorities and indeed to everybody else, including the general public, because the jellyfish are not only bad for the tourist trade, they're also damaging to the fishing industry. In Japan, fishermen are used to jellyfish, but the latest invasions have reached proportions never previously seen. Their nets are swamped by tens of millions of giant jellies weighing as much as 150 kilos. It's thought that overfishing has partially caused the jelly invasions. When fish are removed from the ocean, jellies can eat their food, so the numbers of jellyfish expand. These increasing numbers of jellies eat fish eggs and fry, depleting fish populations still further. We humans prey heavily on fish. We take them out of their natural environment, and in so doing, we take out the jellyfish's predators and competitors at the same time. As a result, the jellyfish have the field left completely open to them. They proliferate freely because they no longer have any rivals. This is a vicious circle. Both humans and the jellyfish fight against the fish, and this leaves more and more space available for these very ancient creatures. They're taking possession of the world's oceans once more, just as they did when they were alone over 600 million years ago. This increase in the jellyfish populations means a reduction in marine biodiversity. If we go on taking more fish, then the jellyfish will continue their expansion all the world's oceans could come to look like this. Every year, hundreds of dead jellyfish wash up on the beaches of Brittany in northern France. But there's one positive side to this proliferation. These people are not just trying to clear the beaches for the tourists. They're after a precious substance hidden within the jellyfish, collagen. Collagen is a complex protein which makes up one third of our body tissues. It's like a cement which binds together all the different kinds of cells. Collagen composes 75% of our skin. Once harvested, the jellyfish are washed and then mashed up. After a long process of purification, fibers of pure collagen can be extracted. Several dozen kilos of jellyfish are necessary to obtain just a few grams of this precious collagen, so valuable in medical applications. In man, there are at least 13 different types of collagen. There's a particular type of collagen protein which we find in jellyfish and which has the same characteristics as human collagen. That's why we are now using collagen extracted from jellyfish to fight rheumatoid arthritis, because it seems to provoke fewer allergies. Also, that means that the risk of rejection is lower than with collagen derived from bovines. There are many potential uses for collagen. It can be used in medical treatments to reinforce the cartilage of joints 
or even for cataract surgery, since collagen is one of the principal components of the eye. It's also used in beauty treatments, since it's the safest and most natural product available for filling out wrinkles. Soon, jellyfish collagen will become an essential ingredient of anti-aging products. Until, that is, something better comes along. Because there's a tiny jellyfish living in the Mediterranean which could well possess the secret of eternal youth. The Turritopsis is only a few millimeters in diameter, yet it's capable of a feat quite unique in the whole of the animal kingdom. What is so special about this jellyfish is its ability to overturn a fundamental principle of biology, which says that life works in one direction only, that is, from birth through to death. This jellyfish is capable, at least for a brief period of its life, of going backwards in the life cycle, passing from the stage of adult to an earlier stage, that of the polyp. If an adult Turritopsis lacks food, or if the sea temperature drops, the jellyfish lets itself fall to the bottom of the sea as if it were dead. But it does not die. Instead, a total metamorphosis begins. The creature's organs and muscles disappear, and in a few hours, its whole body melts until it's no more than a pile of indistinguishable cells. Then, this shapeless mass begins, little by little, to reorganize itself. Branching limbs start to grow and give birth in a few hours to a new polyp. This is a truly extraordinary phenomenon. It's as if there were a butterfly capable of reversing its life cycle, of going backwards and turning itself into a caterpillar again. By inversing the normal course of its life, the jellyfish gets younger. In theory, the process can repeat itself indefinitely, so the Turritopsis is, in theory, immortal. What is probably most extraordinary in the transformation of the jellyfish into a polyp is the change that the cells of the jellyfish can undergo. Normally, a cell develops for a particular function, is destined for a precise form, and must only perform this one function. But what happens instead for the cells of the jellyfish which undergoes this metamorphosis is that the cells are capable of de-differentiating themselves. That's to say, of losing the specific function they had acquired and recovering the ability to engender new types of cells, almost as an embryo does. A muscle cell from the jellyfish could, for example, transform itself into a nerve cell in a new polyp, a feat in complete contradiction to the usual rules of biology. This ability of an adult cell to unwind and become an altogether different type of cell makes it a sort of stem cell. Stem cells have become a holy grail for scientists around the world, as they can be used to replenish old and damaged tissue and so cure diseases like Alzheimer's. One of Turritopsis' close relatives may also open up new possibilities for stem cell research. The hydra belongs to the same family, but is only ever a polyp. It never becomes a jellyfish. This polyp has an exceptional ability to regenerate itself. Cut one in half, and it will in a few days form two new completely functional polyps. Eight hours later, the piece of polyp begins to reorganize its tissues. After 32 hours, tentacles begin to grow. And after 72 hours, the polyp recovers its initial form. It's fascinating because this same tissue, which before was part of a trunk, now develops a foot on one side of the cut and a head on the other. Even more astonishing, when the hydras are mashed up into a soup of cells, they can still reform into a whole and perfectly viable polyp within a few days. It's quite impossible to perform this type of experiment with any other organism which has a nervous system. 
the genes that make it possible for the polyp to reform itself still exist in human DNA, but they're inactive. It means that in theory, humans could activate the ability to regrow themselves. Of course, it would be marvelous if we could succeed in learning from the process of regeneration in these simple systems and so improve the capacity of more complex systems to regenerate themselves. In practical terms, the aim would be to improve the process of tissue and cell regeneration in mammals, in humans. Research on the regenerative gene could lead to a new way of obtaining human stem cells, one that doesn't rely on the controversial practice of obtaining stem cells from human embryos. Jellyfish have already revolutionized medical research with yet another weird and mysterious property. They're able to create light. It's not known why, perhaps to attract prey, repel predators, or even communicate with each other. In the 1960s, the American biologist Osamu Shimomura started to look more closely at this phenomenon. He studied one particular little jellyfish called Iquoria, which produces a faint green light. What he discovered proved to be a radical new tool for scientists, which allows them to light up and study the cells and structures that interest them in every living thing. What Osamu Shimomura was interested in was what was the chemical that allowed the jellyfish to make this light? And he started to isolate this protein biochemically. The protein was called a quorin, but when it made light, the light was blue. It wasn't a green light that was made. And so uh, he also looked at other protein extracts that he had from the jellyfish, and he found that there was one that didn't produce light, but if you shone light onto it, particularly light that was ultraviolet, or blue, that you would get green light back. This protein was named GFP, or green fluorescent protein. Marty Chalfi heard about GFP in 1988. He immediately had the feeling that it was going to be a great help in his research. I was very excited about this because at the time, and I've continued since, I've been working with a small worm. The nice thing about this animal is it's transparent and you can see all the cells in it. Well, if we were able to light up a particular cell, shine, have the cell make green fluorescent protein, shine blue or ultraviolet light on the animal, we could have that cell shine back at us. So we were very, I was very excited about the idea that one could put into an animal a way of inherently marking every cell. Marty Chalfi and his colleagues started by putting light into the simplest of all living organisms, bacteria. It was an extremely exciting situation because what we knew at that point is if we could put it in bacteria, we could put it in anything. And this would light up lots of cells in lots of different organisms. In the months that followed, Marty managed to integrate the fluorescent gene from the jellyfish into the genetic makeup of a small transparent worm. He and his team made the first fluorescent worms. This is a picture of a worm in which we've allowed GFP to be made only in the muscles. So we see all of the muscles along the entire length of the animal. If we look at a larger close-up of this, we can see the individual muscle cells and see how they're nicely lined up with one another as we would go down the length of the animal. The jellyfish fluorescent protein is now a standard tool of medical research 
responsible for scores of major breakthroughs in understanding cell behavior and human disease. The main advantage is that you can use this to look at processes in living cells and in living organisms. You can watch it happening. And this has been a real change because previous to this, this wasn't available. You had to use fixed or prepared samples in ways that you were looking basically at a snapshot. Now we could look at the entire movie. Here, the GFP has been incorporated into cancer cells in a laboratory mouse. The fluorescence makes it possible to follow in real time the path they take in the bloodstream, and so better understand the mechanisms by which cancer spreads. In a sense, it is a revolution in that what we've been able to do is give people a new tool. GFP has brought into being laboratory mice whose skin becomes fluorescent green under ultraviolet light. Besides this quaint little characteristic, they're quite normal. GFP is totally harmless and doesn't alter their biological processes in any way. These mice are also now available in red, since the scientists have discovered variants of GFP, which enable them to obtain new colors. And where there's an opportunity, there's a market. The fluorescent gene has now been used to create a range of fluorescent pets, like these Taiwanese-made fluorescent aquarium fish, which have become all the rage in Asia. Within a decade, the Aquaria jellyfish and its fluorescent protein have revolutionized genetics. From their primeval beginnings at the dawn of animal life on the planet, jellyfish have haunted our seas. They can be both lethal and helpful to us humans, but we're just a moment in time to these eternal creatures, who may still rule the oceans long after we're dead and gone from the planet. Are they primitive? They've made it this far. <laughs> so, so we might think of jellyfish as being very primitive animals, but I might argue back that they're not so primitive after all. They've made it just as far as we have, and they've done it pretty well. I don't think they're primitive at all.